and welcome everyone back in the new year and hopefully a healthy and a successful new year. Um, I think it's the 47th version of the Everyone Can Contribute Cafe. Um, and after last year's session, uh, where we talked about Raycast, which is a, a workflow application on macOS, um, shared by Michael Eigner, and we sneaked the Obstrace acquisition um, into the meetup actually with Seb and Matt joining live. And we thought about, well, what's what's going on with observability? How does it help with CI CD pipelines and, and so on? And this like this somehow sparked the idea for today's meetup. And um, in order to, to get the conversation going, I've prepared um, a long, no, um, a short slide deck. Um, so just to bring everyone up to speed what we are talking about and if you're new to monitoring or observability, so you can like get the feeling or get um, get an idea. I don't want to do any like frontal um, um, screen sharing now and I'm speaking and you're listening and we're not joining the conversation. So I would encourage you to, whenever you have a question or you wanna, wanna discuss a specific topic or something is unclear, um, just to jump in and um, unmute yourself. And um, yeah, that being said, um, Niklas helped me prepare the slides for today. Um, and I think we should be just be going. Um, the thing is, um, where to start with observability? Well, um, something which, which I always think about is when talking about observability and uh, monitoring, Let me quickly make that bigger. Bigger. Um, we have kind of we have security, which we talked about shifting left. We had state black box monitoring. We are slowly. We had been adopting slowly with metrics, so like something with graphite, and later on Prometheus. Then we had stage changes over time and metric data points and everything else. Um, and we have been moving on in the past years with um, defining service level objectives, SLOs, um, with an agreement. So like I'm agreeing with my customer to have 99.5% uh, availability. We have objectives, which are normally higher than the level because we want to have yeah, basically 100%, but uh, not, not really. And there are certain indicators. Um, and this moved into defining the four golden signals, which is defined by the Google SRE, SREs. Um, and it turned out to be something like, okay, we have latency traffic error situation, but at a certain point to see more, to, to get some more insights, to monitor things, to observe things, we need code instrumentation. And um, this was kind of the discussion, okay, the monitoring and metrics, okay, this is a defined state, um, what is observability now? Can we maybe define the three pillars of observability? And this has been quite some discussion in the past years. Um, so like to get things started um, with metrics and with the first pillar, which could be metrics, like we have Prometheus. Prometheus is simply said, um, a daemon which collects the metrics from endpoints and does some auto discovery and much, much more. But in the end, um, it's a simplified way of getting insights into your application, into your services, and collect the metrics. Um, it has its own query language, which is called PromQL. There are certain functions which allow you to aggregate and um, calculate the metrics to present them in a different view. Um, this is helpful to um, write your own queries, um, generate things, and later on also work with alerting. The thing is, as a developer, it's often hard to like start with that. So where do I actually add my code? Um, what is what is like, where do I start with metrics for my monitoring for my SLOs? Is there is a key and a tag? I need values, but what, what is the right way to, to move forward? So um, you can define your own metrics with app instrument app instrumentation, um, but the thing is also, you have infrastructure monitoring like memory, CPU, IO on the node, um, maybe in your Kubernetes cluster, on the pod, on the cluster nodes. 
and much, much more for your services where um, the Prometheus exporter, for example, is implemented in uh, in the in uh, Docker uh, and in specific other ways. Um, there are um, client libraries available to make your life much more easy. Um, so like learning this can be playful with Python example, which is shown on, on the screenshot, um, build something and um, for example, deploy it into Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, install the Prometheus operator, use the custom resource definitions for service monitor um, and inspect the metrics step. Um, this can be like um, a fun learning way to actually move on and say, okay, I've implemented uh, metrics now. But the thing is, um, we not only have metrics when we want to look at things. So um, we are thinking about signals, something which describes a certain state, a, cert a certain thing uh, which happens. And we think about metrics, logs, events, traces, and profiles or profiling. Um, and we also need to break up monolith into microservices and there is so much many things to unpack. So it's, um, it's a great way to like focus on app instrumentation the first time. Um, similar thing for logs. Um, there are so many decisions to be made, um, so many tools involved and stacks to be evaluated um, that it makes sense to really focus on evaluating uh, the options and also as a developer focus on how do I log things? What is structured logging? How can I improve the performance of my logs and so on? So this also evolved in parallel to metrics over the past years. Um, it's still a long story and many, many decisions to be made, um, which led us to traces and distributed traces in, in, in that spe specific regard. And Niklas, please correct me if I'm saying something wrong. Um, the thing is, um, traces and spans work in a different way to logs. So a span has a start and end time, has some context. So you define, you're telling the user where the specific thing happened. And you also need code additions if there is no automated tracing. Um, and you also needed to learn about specific um, implementations, backends, and collectors. So, like backend Jaeger tracing is a tool which can do it. Um, Grafana Tempo is a tool which can do it. Um, and there is a collector with Open Telemetry as a specification which can do it. Um, so, again, um, long learning curve, many, many things to unpack. Um, and tracing became the third pillar for observability, at least. Probably in, in uh, people um, also know traces already before. So probably you can assume it or you can see traces every, not every day, but if you're working with a browser and need to debug your front end locally, when you're clicking on inspect in the network tab, everything in there is also a trace in the end. Every request that is made is a trace. So, and why is no tracing something new in the system? Because traces were established. Um, you need to go to network. Yeah, I remember that. And now I need to press record. You have and turned off record. <laughs> oh. And now you need to refresh the site. And then you see, and you see on the top, uh, the diagram, this is a trace in the end. So since you're doing multiple requests, it's loading something um, and you see now something is happening and it goes zoom after zoom. It depends on how the website is configured. If Google presentation do it really in a, um, not in a parallel way. So they do it in step after step, but you would, the interesting point in traces is that you see the total time. This is the length, the length, the longest span in the end. And then you can also see parallel requests and where parallel requests often happen is in distributed system or in service oriented system. So for example, think about a simple microservice architecture where you have three services, a booking service an order service and an account service. And you want to get now insight into this architecture, how, which service 
called whom and who gets um, with, with which data and how long does it take? And all the stuff is helping with uh, trace or distributed tracing in the end. Um, the big benefit of that is that you can decide which data you want to put in to see the value out of it. So that's in short what traces. This was um, a quick live uh, tryout. Thanks for the reminder of uh, a browser uh, developer tool because this was also the thing which reminded me immediately when I saw Jaeger the first time, I think in 2017 or 2018, um, and thought, oh, I can totally debug uh, slow websites with that. But there's certainly more um, behind it. And like many, many new things came about and we will we will switch i'm not i'm not planning to talk all day um but here's the thing um profiling also came around and became pop popular with open source in the past year actually so like providing application performance insights and see um when a function is called too often or taking too much time um that you can um see that in a graph and analyze that similar to how you work with traces and it's uh, it's an, ad an additional data source and so we could theoretically speak of the four pillars of observability now um, but there's discussion going on if it's whether the pillars or if it's something else with observability um, for now um, we also thought about discussing like an overlap with observability since we kind of used to collect logs and metrics um, over the past decade, um, distributed tracing came a little later because it, uh, there were open source tools being developed um, with open tracing and open census. Um, and with open source, the adoption just got wider and much more like, powerful also in community building. Um, we've seen that like metrics can be ag aggregated Logging is tracking the changes in the system, like in a in a data stream, basically. Um, and to the like to the picture, which is shown on the right, um, with the I don't know, is it called intersection? Um, yeah, where intersection or overlap. It's, it's the same. Where, where everything comes together, we actually need to put in profiling as a data source or as a way to observe things or to correlate or to analyze things. So we need all this data being available, but there is a certain um, overlap what is collected. For example, I could write a trace and a span similar to how I write logs in my application, like defining timing points and durations and saying, okay, the uh, request to the uh, uh, for the client to the website is dependent on my microservices architecture in the background and the query goes to the HTTP server, to the database cluster in the backend, to the Redis cache and to the front end again. Um, what is blocking the service, for example? Now, I think um, also that a lot of people are using like from, probably it's also interesting now, of course, with tracing, but also with how it comes from, how would I use it on myself? Probably some people are already using it already. So at least the two intersections, so metrics and logging is mostly the standard, I would say in production apps, because you use it mostly also in a daily base because you would get metrics to get the data to see if the system is up and running. Then you probably get an alert. And what you do then afterwards is because with a metric, you don't have enough information. So you don't know what's happening in the system. You go into the logging intersection and check in your logging tool how the logs are in there and which events happened afterwards to make you do guess or you know directly what's happened there and then you're fixing it so um this is also a step that probably a lot of people do um and this is mostly the basic system that everyone has and also interesting because in the scala what you see regarding low volume, high volume means like how many information needs to be stored. So some met metrics are mostly only numbers and not so many data that need to be stored for logs. It can be really big. If you need to be, have a big system for doing all the logging stuff. So it's also interesting how long you logging and also the same with trace. Trace are a little bit smaller than logs mostly. 
but you need also to store all this data. So um, this is also an important uh, point, I would say. And I think um, data is a good point. You need storage for that. So if you're planning to, to evaluate something or plan for the long term, um, metrics, traces, and logging, I think the logs will take consume the most space if not aggregated. Um, but yeah, it needs backends, it needs tools, which, which might need uh, availability, high availability, um, distributed systems and so on. So um, it's, it's a challenge and you might be seeing or might be seeing the, the three pillars of observability being discussed on the internet. You might also be seeing something which, oops, which mentions um, the knowns and the unknowns. So like the unknown unknowns, uh, things we are not aware of and do not understand. Um, this is something which is mentioned, for example, when you read uh, the honeycomb.io um, blog posts around what data they collect and which like events and signals. I think they're using a column-based storage engine in their cloud and they collect basically everything with the agent and the beelines. So they have a lot of data available and you might be drawing a conclusion from um, something, I think there's on the next slide, um, like, did you know that maybe the DNS resolution latency um, increases your cloud costs? This is something which I probably, I would be thinking about it because I, I know that DNS is always a problem. Um, but in the end, um, it's, it's not really a known fact, um, but we might be understanding it if we're just collecting all the data which, which we have available. Um, on the other side, like the known things which we want to monitor is monitor the state of your application. Um, you either get ping, ping works or ping does not work. Um, the slides also contains a reference at the, references at the bottom. Um, so everything to learn async. Um, let me see what else is there. Um, yeah, one, one example which happened last year and we discussed it in the Everyone Can Contribute Cafe were, were the Docker Hub rate limits where we didn't really know what will be happening. We knew that there will be limits when you're doing a Docker pull. Um, and after a while, I think 100 in six hours or something, it didn't work anymore. Um, so we thought about what could be affected. Our CI/CD pipelines, because we're using Docker, um, cloud native deployments, Kubernetes clusters, clusters and so on, organizations behind the nut, which is still a thing um, in modern infrastructure, and, and also cloud providers, which act behind certain IP um, nets and so on. So um, we had a known state, like we could simulate something. Uh, we wrote a premises exporter back then and could monitor th something. But the thing is, if you cannot detect that, um, or you would like to de detect that, um, an unknown state could be like, you're deploying something in your cluster, the CI/CD pipeline, kind of work, but you have logging with uh, too many requests. And the problem is you cannot reliably detect that and your customers see different prices on your website and they think they bought something for a hundred dollars, but actually it's costing 200 because you increased the price, but it didn't reach them. And this could be a problem for many businesses. Um, and we thought about, yeah, how to, how to really um, understand all these things. Now, um, coming to metrics um, or coming from tracing metrics and logs and also a little bit of profiling to um, an idea of unifying that. Um, and open telemetry um, was founded or just to circle back a little bit in time in 2016, um, for distributed tracing, uh, the open source projects, open census, I think this was driven by Google and open tracing have been formed. And this was a specification and also um, client library implementation, which allowed you um, to instrument your code and send traces to tools like Sipkin, Jaeger, Datadog, Lightstep, and so on. Um, this Got, has gotten like um, dual development or overlaps. So open telemetry was founded, founded, yeah, 
Um, and it aimed to merge open tracing and open census. It became a CNCF um, tech uh, working group for in the observ observability space. The project was uh, created and in 2021, it also added metrics and logs um, to its agenda and became an incubation, incubating project. So hopefully soon will be uh, GA ready to use and graduating. Um, and most recently last week, open tracing has been deprecated or there is the idea to dep deprecate it and announce it, uh, which is linked. So um, open tele telemetry is here to stay. Now, what is it? How can you like use or combine it with uh, your existing tool stack or how can you get started? One thing you need to understand is there is a collector or a sidecar, which then consumes uh, the traces and the metrics, but you still need to provide your own backends. So for example, Jaeger for traces, Prometheus for metrics. Um, if you want to instrument your application, there are client libraries and SDKs in development which either allow you manual instrumentation with C++ Go and so on, uh, which is linked in the uh, getting started documentation, for example, for Go, or um, certain languages allow you to do auto instrumentation. So something which I think plays proxy somewhere in the code and then does automate, automated tracing or automated instrumentation. Um, so this has, has been heavy under development in the past, I would say, two years um, and is getting more traction in especially 2022. Um, from a visual overview, you can think of um, having the, uh, the agent or the collector service running in your Kubernetes cluster or either being instrumented from pods from virtual machines and so on. Um, this is a picture which I copied from the docs. Other examples for adoption range, for example, for Kubernetes system components, which has been added in 1.22 um, in alpha, I think. Um, so the adoption is, is going further. Um, more ideas on using open telemetry, uh, for example, with uh, ops stress tracing, there has been an early demo being shared last week or this week. Um, the other idea is, other idea is um, to link metrics with traces. This is called exemplars. If you run a, if you run into that, um, and one other thing which came about is CI/CD observability with tracing, like tracing your pipelines and find out the job duration and so on, uh, which can also be achieved with open telemetry, um, and. Um, just skipping in there. The thing is, so we talked about tracing, like how, do, how does a trace and the span look like and the, the backends and so on. Um, this is a copy from the earlier slide. The idea is um, that you can see, for example, the cloud resource costs. They are very high because you have many CI CD jobs, which are long lasting and failing all the time. You actually don't need them. Um, you have slow caches for CI/CD in your infrastructure, and you have a certain network la latency when containers are being pulled. This is something which is, I would say, hard to detect unless you're scraping the logs and, and trying to understand and build it by yourself. Now, the idea is, um, and I have been working on this um, in the past two weeks, um, to create um, the jobs to be done, what needs to be implemented, for example, in GitLab, um, defining where to send it, like defining the open telemetry endpoint in CI/CD variables, in instrument the actual code, the server and the runner, um, send the traces and the spans to the open telemetry collector, have visualization in its simplest version, just using the Jaeger front end, um, because using Jaeger as a backend. Um, this is described in this. Um, GitLab issue, which is, I think, 15 pages long, meanwhile. Um, but yeah, the idea is to really st um, start the implementation and make CI CD observability a breeze in the future. Um, the other thing to watch out for is um, metrics are GA in open telemetry and logs are experimental. 
um, could be or will be a unified way to instrument apps, but still uh, developers need to learn and adopt, which, which could be you. Um, and you also need to evaluate whether it makes sense to migrate everything to open telemetry um, from slash metrics endpoints in applications. Um, I think I'm talking too fast. Um, are there any questions so far? Okay. Um, the other thing which is like interesting in observability, and this is something for um, left shifting SLOs, um, quality gates, um, which is something we discussed in 2020, so like one year and some months ago, around Captain, um, using the knowledge of metrics and alerts, um, writing your own prompt calculus for Prometheus with the open SLO format, um, and then defining the service level objective and say, I'm deploying this to staging environment. Um, the Docker pool, for example, fails um, because the rate limiting happened. And I don't want to deploy that into production. Um, a quality gate should measure that and, and tell me about it. This is one of the more advanced um, things you can do with metrics and um, left shift the SLOs. So Captain basically plays the quality gate um, and you can use either the graphic, graphical interface or um, also like define your own YAML if you want to. Um, no, it's, it's very easy to try out. And there are many tutorials available um, to instrument and uh, not to instrument to measure the um, service level objectives for your application. Um, for me personally, this would have helped me, for example, detect certain CI, C, um, C++ uh, coroutine crashes on the stack, but only with, with thousand API clients, which you don't have in a development environment. Um, and um, having, having that, for example, in a test environment, would certainly have helped with quality gates, not merging it and not releasing it to customer environments. Um, this is a de definition how it works. Um, and this is a playground demo. Um, but yeah, the thing is, Captain should be acting as a, can, can act as a quality gate, Prometheus for SLOs, um, and simulating a production environment or incidents is hard. So we could be adding, um, chaos engineering to that. Um, the other thing we can we need to keep in mind is how to generate SLOs. This is also a hot topic in the future in the observability space, in the monitoring space. Um, yeah, and chaos engineering, similar thing. You want to kill your pods asynchronously, randomly. You maybe want to um, Chaos in, do chaos engineering with uh, network connections. Um, um, maybe I'm, I'm creating something around DNS or BGP routing um, and still verify that um, everything is operational and the service level objectives are still matching. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, yeah, it's basically a summary of what you can do uh, with service level objectives and learn about instrumentation and observability um, and use the benefits of cloud environments. The other thing is like to see the value in logs, metrics and traces to get started quite easy um, and see how far you can get in your observability story. Um, in the end, um, you shouldn't reinvent the wheel um, because there are many there are tools out there, there are platforms out there providing these capabilities and also like document everything on your way, uh, which we are currently doing. Um, the other thing which is interesting or which, um, which hopefully comes around is like some machine learning, um, which allows us to correlate metrics and traces in the future and to easy, easy, make it more easy to identify any bottlenecks or CI/CD pipelines being blocked or external resources being the root cause of it. 
Um, and the other thing I want to highlight is CD events, which is a newly formed specification um, or to be formed specification for continuous delivery uh, events, um, which sounds very interesting to join and spark the conversation, not only for um, continuous delivery, but also for cloud native environments. Um, yeah, that's the recap. Um, I copied the slide deck from a different one. And actually, um, resources are linked over here. Um, and we want to start an open discussion now. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is um, I own this domain and I thought about creating a resource for observability and learning it. Um, so this is a not yet fully functional um, MCADOC space um, where everyone can contribute. And um, I will be working on it and I will encourage you to also join and submit your merge requests um, so that we can create a learning platform um, for everyone. Okay. Um, I think it was a lot of information. Um, questions, thoughts, use cases for observability. I have found it. Oh, never mind. Go for it. No, Ryan, go ahead. So I can. I, know, I was I was just gonna ask. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Maybe just in general. So yeah, I also I've been uh, working on building a a open source continuous profiler for about a year now. But one of the things that um, that I'm kind of interested in is like, you know, with obviously there's like tons of tools out there. There's tons of signals that you can like add to your your workflows. But I think one of the interesting things is is like how you sort of evaluate the cost versus the benefit of adding in these different like you know tools and signals and that kind of stuff so that you don't get to the point where it's like you know you've added logs and metrics and traces and profiling but it costs more than the system that you're you know monitoring and so i don't know i'm, I'm just curious what uh people's thoughts are on that mm. Probably I can give a little bit view or my view on that. So because we started, we're using mostly only open source observability tools. So we don't use any vendor right now. And what we did, so in my past companies or my past experience, we used for standards, but mm -hmm. in my current company, we do in a full other way. So we use nothing from the stretch. So we stripped out everything using only the basic stuff and implement stuff when we need something. So because you get, the problem is really in observability that you easily shift in from signal only to noise and humans are not doing then anything. So then you have only a big, um, big boil of mud of information and then you don't know where to start and then you probably ignore it yeah, because it's not important and you, data configuration drift probably. And the main benefit is then um, really starting with less information and you will get up and up and up because not everyone started with 100% and not everyone is in Google, not everyone is in Amazon. So mostly companies have a lot of simpler systems mostly. And it's also what we now see in the whole cloud native space. Or I would say at least in the observability space, I found really interesting because we had this, yeah, we need to have distributed systems. These needs to be different components. And mostly all new uh, components that are coming up are mostly modular monoliths in the end. So that you can turn off features on and off, but you don't need to have multiple deployments. You need to check how it's working. Yeah, of course, the blast radius is a, bit, a little bit higher, but pretty clear, mostly, most people don't hit that. So, and for the specialized, you should go into the specialized version. That's also totally fine. So. But as I said, I think not everyone has the same problems. And that's also why not every company has the same use case. And that's the problem, how to find a general way, how to adopt it. So I think there is no really general way, but mm -hmm. you can get a lot of insights from the community when you talk to people, how they handle this problem. And you probably get, oh, this was a little bit complex, what we currently doing, probably we should reshape it. And, I think the main role is overall 
to reduce the complexity that human can take it and the machine can take that complexity, but it doesn't need to be that you need to really drill down to through at least five or six layers and finding then the problem underneath. So because you're more, because you're really distracted by all the information that's probably not now interesting in the case. Yeah, that I would add to that in short. <laughs> interesting yeah i mean that's interesting take yeah thanks and i think also what a difference can be if you're an early adopter or not so if you are starting really early with the tools then they are not so complex and you grow with them when you when you're on top on that then it's also probably not so problematic to get this but for example in prometheus yeah we get now we had like we implemented for us also the remote right internally mm -hmm. for some tools that we are using and this was like a new feature i know i used now prometheus for five years mostly mm -hmm. in different setups but um it's also hard to keep up on all the information and the, the community is also changing all the parts so because everyone has different requirements it's also fine yeah yeah and Speaking of like keeping track of all the changes, um, Prometheus um, is building an agent, which is a feature flag at the moment, um, which is built on remote rights and like making it easier to um, have sort of something which was the push gateway in the past, because it's not just you're scraping actively metrics and connecting to the services, but you maybe want to sort of push something to Prometheus via remote right um this is going on and this is like I, I think it's a feature flag it's currently being tested um and the other thing um i'm when i'm looking at ci cd observability in gitlab um and this is like the uh the feature request issue i created it i'm i'm worried about when i'm adding this line of app instrumentation for open telemetry for example does this impact the application performance? And not just like this is a small installation where some CI CD pipelines do run, um, but it should be a large scale system. And um, I'm not sure if there are probably from early adopters, there are benchmarks or metrics available um, allowing you to say, okay, this is a good thing turned on by default um, or saying, okay, this is something I don't want to be turned on by default. The problem then is you're not collecting data when it's not on. Um, right. And in the case when you debug a problem, then turning on tracing and wishing for data being generated in the past, which is not possible, um, or might not be possible, um, is super hard. It's a similar thing to, hey, we didn't collect the logs from the server um, and now we cannot SSH into it because it's broken um it's it's super hard to like measure and define for a specific environment and say this this works that way um one one thing to really look into and to for this have sort of a playground environment staging environment something like that for dev environment and really try to measure that for your use case for your application it adds more workload to yourself um but I do see the benefit of learning and understanding how it's being done and maybe onboard new team members, document it for yourself or even contribute to the community and or to the wider community and um, help provide feedback and say, okay, this is working in my environment or I have found or adopted this use case for telemetry, for example. So how do you, so how do you find that balance then? Like, or I guess kind of like, do you have any, uh... I mean, maybe it's it's on a case by case kind of thing, but finding that balance between when you add something new or when you remove something that's just become like too noisy and it's not, you know, actually being, you know, because it's like it's always the thing where as soon as you turn off the thing that you need, then like the error happens. And like you said, like you can't go back in time. And so I'm curious, you know, when you're looking at tools and, you know, CI CD pipelines, whatever it is, like, how do you kind of balance those uh kind of like competing aspects that's a good question um i think you need to make a mistake 
and get flooded, for example, by logs. So you're learning by mistakes, an incident happens and you have a hundred gigabytes of log files you need to search in um, and your Elasticsearch cluster is not happy, for example. Um, right. So this helps um, if you want to be proactive about it. I think um, as a taking my developer hat on, I'm thinking of, I needed to learn, for example, the structured logging Previously, we just in C++, we logged everything. We did throw our sec traces and the logs were not just one line, it was multi-line. It was not, users couldn't read it, but developers were happy. Um, developers were not happy because users created bug reports because of a stack trace. Um, but in the end, I think having a common sense of this could be something interesting to log. For example, you're starting an HTTP request, you're ending it finding some timing points um, which are helpful for logs and traces i think is a is a good way to start and say i really want to see when um, the client is doing an http request when does it start when does it end and then i have the black box in between um, i could go the route of saying i'm just adding logs in the different thread or different application and then i have the tools um, to to search and cover that or maybe I'm thinking of, hey, this could be a trace. Um, we're starting here and we are forwarding basically the trace ID to the other application. And then I get to see a timeline um, with specific spans. And I also have the possibility to add more context to it because a log line is just, it's text or it's JSON or it's something else. But sometimes you really wanna add, this has been executed in a Docker environment um, with version whatever, um, specific other text you can, you can add or enrich uh, to the uh, trace uh, context. And this helps you to see, oh, um, the bottleneck is because uh, we're using a too old version of Docker in, in that environment. And for some reason, the customer requests always go that route. Maybe we, should, we need to fix our HA proxy or something else. So I think thinking of use cases and incidents in the, your environment, which you hopefully have from the past, um, can be really helpful to say, this is a starting point I really want to look into. Um, I hope this helps. I also can uh, recommend this book. A philosophy uh, of software design by John Osterwood, because when we're mostly talking about complexity, we think only that the systems are complex to understand, but mostly what I uh, saw in my last companies was um, that we had more of the other problem because Osterwood is defined a little bit different or adding to that. So that's also hard to make changes in the system when systems are really complex and it's not easy to do a change then you have also a big complex system and then you probably don't do that. And that's why the people are feared of doing these changes. So you should be, have changes need to be simple and it should be less impact. That's the reason why we have all these technologies. So with Kubernetes is complex, of course, but it delivers also some value of course that we can run probably workload in parallel. We can probably also use one cluster for doing development and also production. The, the, um, the, of course, the root cause when then Kubernetes is down is probably another problem, but we can do then easily test it in the same system. And we have all these tools, but I think the other problem that's coming with that is like you have a really steep learning curve. So you need to know a lot of tools. And one different thing is knowing things and having experience. Because knowing some stuff, I heard about the new tool that's coming up, something was posted on Hacker News, my favorites. So when people are coming up, yeah, we saw this new tool. And I say, yeah, okay, what is your experience with that? So how do you saw it when it's not working? Because most of these are the interesting times because then you so see if it's fit for your use case. And there are a lot of tools that you can use. And it's the same pillar comes also when, you, when, we, when we're talking about CI, CD, CD. So some people are doing CI, of course, some people are doing continuous um, delivery, but a lot of less people doing really continuous deployment in the end because continuous deployment is quite harder because you need to have a full automated environment. So everything needs to be done, no manual intervention anymore. 
And this is probably not what every can use out of a box because you need to understand the system. And then you cannot also port it from big systems that are using it, that's fitted for their use case, port it to you and it, you get the same results. They build it for the reason because they want to save some money. They want to save money. doesn't need to be safe infrastructure because it could be save people time because they can work on other topics to bring your product further. So that's a lot of stuff that's ongoing. That's also the reason why you probably also not to jump on every hype train that's coming up. And also sometimes they of off Twitter of all the instant, uh, interesting stuff that is happening outside. A lot of people doing interesting stuff, but we have enough information out there the problem the more problem is find the right content for you working on a simple problem or working on a problem and doing a focus drop instead of turning out in different spaces and then you make like digging a new hole then you have a new hole and then you never never have anything finished that's not a good result in there yeah definitely been there done that <laughs> yeah that's Everyone does that at some time. So it's interesting because there's so many space and the problem is that we all, all people don't have enough time to learn all the things. It's mm. more focus of having um, the things, yeah. Other questions? Or oh, we can talk about other topics. We can talk about blockchain, so um we can talk about rust i'm in for that so you want to do blockchain observability and rust we can i could I'm pro all. pros that we do on the next meetup i can show you a blockchain i can show you rust i can show you bp uh, bp bp bf so berkeley packet filters everything combined Okay, deal. Um, you got yourself some work. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. It's um, no problem. That's that's the reason why I'm mostly saying like to do that. So learning something new. But Michael, we don't need to program so many Rust codes. So it's for sure. So that we not extend our one hour mostly. And we have six hours <laughs> in a row. Yeah. It's um. Quite cool. And yeah, maybe we can not only, so I think the last time we, we did the Rust advanced session was the Prometheus exporter with the web server. Um, there is um, an SDK for Rust with open telemetry, which, which also would be interesting. And I'm planning to work on adding open telemetry to CI CD, at least try a POC and see how far I get. Um, and I also want to create more learning resources regarding how to get started. Um, and not just like the five minute success, you add something to a code and then something says hello world, but you really find a use case in, in an application. Um, like this is the HTTP request, this is starting, this is ending, um, finding a real use case. Um, or maybe breaking something. Uh, and I will be giving a talk next week at Chaos Carnival. Um, and I'm thinking of um, using chaos engineering to break something, which then gets alerted and you get to see something which you probably cannot simulate um, in a staging environment. Um, I also thought about, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there is a, um, a tool called Cube Doom, uh, which actually kills pods. Um, which one can, could use for chaos engineering in Kubernetes. Um, yeah, and also see how distributed tracing then works, for example. It would be interesting to see the traces if something is randomly being killed, um, which also provides insights and ideas um, for real time, or for re no, not real time, real world incidents. Um, because most often time an incident is just there and it's an S1 high priority um, and you need to react upon things you already have or you need to learn like log4j just before Christmas. This was fun. Oh, it was not fun, but it was sarcastic fun. Um, 
it depends on which application set in your company is, I would say. To, to be honest, for me, it was fun to learn about more, uh, to learn more about um, dependency scanning with um, Gripe and Travi. Um, and get to see how these like tools work to do. Ah, it's no, it's for container scanning. Dependency scanning is something else. Um, yeah, and to, to understand what is the potential of your pinning your Docker container in your pipeline or in your deployments to a specific version and you're never updating it, you're never gonna update it again, um, but still shipping CVEs and vulnerable uh, software application applications and dependencies and so on. Um, maybe, maybe we can revisit uh, supply chain um, in the future. I guess this will be a hot topic for KubeCon Europe in May. Um, yeah, I'm not trying to put myself too much work on my plate. Um, but I would totally love to work with you, Niklas, on... We could do the uh, signing Rust container images also with uh, Kruzik from the chain guard guys. This would be interesting for maybe April. Well, let's see about it. First, I would love to collaborate on blockchain Rust observability and other things. Can you use the... Uh, gitlab.com group uh, namespace. Um, maybe we create a new group or we just use observability I or something. Provide a slide and all this stuff. So, but um, I need to uh, check which uh, blockchain we will use. So, there are multiple options out there. There's not one blockchain, of course. So, there it's a different system. It's like when you're talking about a distributed system this can mean that it could mean that so there's not one solution for the problem and they have also different trade-offs because they're working also with different consensus and so on um, but i would make a short overview of that and probably bring you a little bit from the point from the, what bitcoin is what ethereum is so what solana is um so these are the most common chains that everyone know and then probably also to program on that because sometimes in simple words, blockchain is not nothing different like in an immutable database in the end. And you can also do like um, search out procedures or stop procedures in um, database language. And this is like a smart contract or program or, how, or however you would call it. It's nothing special. So um, yeah. I just copied the, um, we have in our handbook on everyone.contribute.com. There is a slide template which I've been using for today, you can just copy that. Yeah, I will do that. Oh, we talked a little over time. Um, By over time, any, we have 7 p.m. On time. Yeah, I'm, I'm in, in GitLab speedy meeting, sorry. Um, <laughs> any uh, Anything else we could chat about? Everyone is silent. Um, I think observability is just mind blowing. A lot of stuff to learn and mostly also to use. Let's see. I think, to be honest, it took me, when did I start? In March 2020? It took me one and a half years to really fully understand what I can do with open telemetry. Um, and that I that it's a specification and a collector, but I do need to bring my own backend. Um, and like also seeing um, the adoption of the clients and SDKs, which which helped me understand. Okay, this is how I can instrument it with tracing. Um, it's still a complex thing to add certain headers and then functions and dive into the code again. Um, but it feels like a much more unified way um, and stable way, which is also used by vendors um, rather than building something on your own. Um, yeah, it's a similar thing with 
understanding Kubernetes, um, I need to generate the YAML and I need to understand all the components, which in contrast is not necessary because you need to find a use case and deploy an application, a service. And, um, and once that vibe in your head uh, gets going, um, you kind of get addicted to doing more. Okay. Um, anything else you want to chat about? Otherwise, I would just stop the recording. And one, one last question. Um, are there any good tracing libraries for non-server use cases? So for desktop clients, mobile clients? You can use Optimetry for that. And I because it pushes the data. So if you have a prompt that it needs to be connected, to something, but tracing most rewards that you push the data in that, so they will not be pulled. Okay, so, so that means the problem with getting Prometheus up in a local client, they were in a prompt run in, you've been 2016 from Tom, which you also um, a blog post how to do that because the client is pushing the data into the system, it's quite easy to do that. So or it's technically possible. Otherwise, it would, otherwise, was around it would be also possible but of course and a lot of more security teams have problems to implement this because you're probably more, mostly nutted and all this stuff but um you can do this with open trail or open telemetry so just searching for a good library or for which language the api myself you, you can i think you can use the javascript library from open telemetry um and build it with npm or with node.js I think you are, we are thinking about um, a Visual Studio Code extension. Um, maybe correct me if I'm wrong with the assumption. Um, um, not directly. So I'm just searching for a way, because most most stuff I see nowadays is server-centric. So distributed tracing and whatnot. And I have mostly the, the problem that I need to have classical end-user clients. And pushing the data is there and open telemetry is a good foundation to have now a, a standard way to doing it. But building it into things like C++ applications is a little bit harder because there is no unified way for networking. So that's- So the, uh, the, the technical background for, for open telemetry, it uses gRPC in the background for sending or emitting traces to a um, open telemetry collector. This is basically a daemon which needs to be running in your network where the application is in. So there, there needs to be a direct connection. I'm not sure if there is some proxying or for forwarding already in place, but I do think that when you implement the open telemetry C++ client, in your application's code. So your, the thing is, um, let me see if I can quickly find it in the open telemetry uh, plus plus getting started. Um, let me see. When you add that, um, the things you need to do, it's experimental tracing is stable. Okay. Um, do we have examples? We have a lot of examples. Okay. Um, this is not something I was looking for. Uh, so like you need to import, I should look at the examples. Um, you need to import, um, the headers, of course. And um, I think it's Apache license, so it might not be compatible with GPL. I had that problem in the past, but I created a POC anyways. Um, so I, I tried playing around with it with a simple timing point three mm. years ago. I think it's broken now because the, um, the API changed. But the thing is you need to kind of initialize the tracer, which um, is relatively straightforward, I would say. Um, and um, let me see if I can get tracer. Okay, we're 
we're getting something out of it and then we're running something and inside we're creating a scope in a thread and okay we're starting a span and then it's been the thread is joined and then everything is gone okay might not be the best example but it from what i've seen it's it's it has gotten a lot easier to add to add it to your code like it was in the beginning where you had it to like include one page of things and then define something um i think the most important part is that you instantiate um, the tracer or the object which then sends something um, over there um, one thing you need to keep in mind and um, let me see if i can find the uh, cd open telemetry issue Quick. um it's not this one it's the other one but it doesn't matter okay. So for some reason, everything is slow today. Uh, what was I looking for? We do have, ah, this one. Um, like the configuration you need for open telemetry from the client side is really straightforward. You define a server, you're defining some authorization uh, maybe as, a, as an uh, HTTP header, and um, you're defining the traces exporter, which can be, for example, Jaeger or just uh, open telemetry as the collector. And this is something you need on the client, which can be manipulate, manipulated by environment variables. So you need to ensure that this, um, this doesn't get overridden, which, which I tried describing over here. And um, that's basically, or that's, that should be about it. Um, in this specific example, it's about adding something with Ruby and Go, um, which I look forward to trying out. The thing is, um, open telemetry can get quite overwhelming um, if you're looking into um, this picture, for example. And my recommendation is to really start as simple as possible, instrument a demo application, use Jaeger tracing um, as a tracing backend because Jaeger also provides its own UI. So you can really start simple um, and use the open telemetry collector in the middle um, and build your own. I think there are some demo environments around with Docker Compose and probably Kubernetes meanwhile, um, build your own or use an existing demo environment and really um, do shorter iterations on adding um, traces and spans to your code, then open up the UI and then evaluate uh, what's going on. Um, or maybe in the, or maybe um, maybe you can use Grafana, you might be using Obstrace in the future, um, something which which is already there and you don't need to worry about like installing 10 different tools and, and whatnot, just use a simple installation. Um, and when it comes to adding more than that and really instrumenting the application, you already have the Git history, uh, things you learned, you hopefully documented. Um, and there are certain examples which allow you to follow along. Um, for this specific thing I have, found, let me see, it's not an issue anymore. It should be an epic soon. Um, for example, um, Kubernetes has implemented that and Kubernetes is written in Go. Um, this should be the pull request for the AP server. And we can just see the changes. Um, Probably it doesn't make sense to view the changes on the web interface, but there is there are certain examples out there which implement that. And this is something our users can actually use in production already. So I'm I'm really a fan of learning from 
someone else or learning from others how they did it and especially reading the diffs um, on, on what happened and uh, maybe the mistakes made on the way or the performance problems which, which were discovered. I hope this helps. Perfect. Um, talking endless about observability today. Um, looking forward to, to our next meetup, um, which will be on the second Tuesday in February. Um, I have no idea what it is, um, but we will announce it in our meetup group. And looking forward to chatting about blockchain, Rust, and observability, Niklas, right? Yeah. Okay, observability could be hard, but I can. It's, I think blockchain is quite hard and also showing a little bit what you can do on that. And Rust um, is like at least an hour or at least probably two hours, but I will speak a little bit faster and we can watch the video in slower motion instead of watching videos faster than then. Uh, yeah, but we can do that. So I can talk about blockchains and web three. Okay. So. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Web3, blockchain, and learning um, about the technology behind it. Um, sounds super interesting. Thanks for that. And um, everyone watching, we will meet each other next month. And until then, have a great time, stay healthy, and see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.